Live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh, it's the Science Cafe with your host, Brian Mallow. Good evening. Hello, everybody. How are you? Welcome. It's Thursday night. It's Science Thursday here at the Daily Planet Cafe. It's live from the North Carolina... Deja vu. Live. Uh, here at the Daily Planet Cafe in the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. It's our science cafe, and um, we're very happy to see you here. We have a lot going on tonight, and, and we should let you know that we're looking f for it to be this way uh, very often, which is we have the Raleigh Astronomy Club giving a talk in the Daily Planet, and we have films from the Jackson Hole Film Festival, which was a big science and nature uh, film festival, and we're uh, going to be showing more of those films, but right now that's going on in the auditorium next door in the WRAL Theater. So a uh, lot happening tonight, whereas we're normally closed at this time. But this program will be over at approximately 8 o'clock, and this building will still be open till 9. So you can feel free to explore the, the rest of this building for another hour if you choose. So, you know, we've had a lot of really cool topics, and um, re recently we have had some veterinary and animal topics, but... This time, it's our own head veterinarian, and he, uh, not originally from North Carolina, but educated here, and he went to NC State, and in addition to being head of our, uh, uh, being a vet at the museum, which that might sound odd to you, but as he'll explain, we happen to have a huge collection of live animals here at the museum, larger than most museums, uh, rivaling a lot of zoos. We have a lot of animals here. Um, and and uh, and as I just learned, it's like that's not even counting all the invertebrates, all the insects and other arthropods. But we've got fish and reptiles and mammals. We have all sorts of stuff here, um, in addition to the insects. So um, he is also on, on an adjunct professor at the NC State College of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, but to us, he's our own. Uh, we have on up uh, upstairs on the second floor windows on animal health where people can actually see him and his staff do veterinary procedures. But I'm sure he's going to tell you about this. It's basically the adventures of a museum veterinarian. How about a nice round of applause for Dan Dombrowski? Thank you very much. And I think, uh, will this flipper work for slides? Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me today. And I, I am uh, the veterinarian here at the museum. Uh, and today, I hope to tell you guys a little bit about what I do uh, every day, I guess, here at the museum and our program in, in veterinary medicine. And so the first thing, um, it, it may seem a little unusual uh, to have a veterinarian at a museum, but we do have a large collection of animals. We're going to talk a little bit about that and the types of animals that we have here. So I think if you guys have questions, you can save them uh, until the end. Is that better? Do you like that better? Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, save your questions and then I think we'll have plenty of time to go over those and answer them. And my slides today, I, I have a set of slides, mostly images and pictures, just to kind of show you guys uh, a little bit of the diversity um, of what we get to work with here in our veterinary services group at the museum. And the first slide that's up uh, just shows uh, one of our sort of typical cases. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it, but this is a, a look down. This is a marine fish, and it's anesthetized, and we do work with a lot of fish here, and so this is the type of thing, if you visit us uh, up at our window on animal health, that you can sort of talk to us and join in and, and interact with us through the window uh, as working on these cases. So at, uh, in the museum, again, to tell you a little bit about our collection and the animals that we have, Um, a lot of invert 
systems, and then also for terrestrial systems. So, on exhibit, primarily reptiles, uh, amphibians, and fish. In our program collection, though, we do have a few uh, birds and mammals as well, and those are kind of the cases I'm going to go through and talk to you guys about. So, our working on animal health as a veterinarian. I went to school here at NC State. I graduated in 2006, so about nine years ago now. Uh, time kind of flies by. Uh, but I, I went to school with lots of folks, uh, about 80 classmates. And a lot of them work now with dogs and cats and what we call small animal clinics. So those are your family veterinarians. Some went on to do agricultural species, and they may work with, uh, you know, owls, and, and some work with small ruminants like goats. Some are equine veterinarians. Well, I went on to become a museum veterinarian, and so my job is, is pretty unique to all those other positions when my classmates come to visit and, and sort of check out what I do. It's a little different than you know, most, of, most of them are doing these days. We have, again, an area, a clinical space, an exam room, and a laboratory that has a window onto our public floor here at the museum. So while we're doing our, our work that we're going to do anyways in the care of the animals at the museum, Folks can come right up to the window and, and join in and ask questions with microphones and cameras. Uh, I say it's like a cooking show. You know, we bring out the animal and, you know, here's the turtle and we're doing a physical exam today. And then, you know, as we move through the, the cases, we work with a lot of students on the inside of the window. Uh, students that are interested in becoming veterinarians and then some that are already in that school. And so as we train them to do uh, their clinical work on these species, again, the public joins in and participates and asks questions. Uh, a big part of what we do, again, with our students, we work with pre-med students at NC State. And so we get to help them learn about these exotic species. They work with fish and clouds and amphibians in a way that they often they don't have uh, opportunities to, to work with in um, other places. So, so that's a really fun part of my job, working with the students and all these sort of strange animals that we work with. At the window, I am on out as we're doing our, our, our work in medical management. It's all real. This is all the stuff that we would do behind the scenes, but we're able to do this and really share it with folks that they're interested. We do everything from physical exams on our animals uh, to health checks to you know, regular checkups that you would get. Um, this is a, uh, there's a slide up now with uh, one of our vet students and you know, a visiting veterinarian that was here from the, the College of Vet Medicine. So a lot of times we have other veterinarians come in from the community and they share their experiences with our students and, and with our visitors as well. We uh, also not only do we do physical exams and sort of the, the basic stuff, but we're also set up to do surgeries. Those are usually the most popular things. Uh, we don't have tons of surgeries uh, necessary in the collection, but when we do, we're able to set those up and do those procedures and provide those as well. And so, and, uh, on this slide, this is a group of folks kind of gathering around and watching the procedure on a giant snapping turtle. If I can make this work. There we go. Um, it was ready for surgery. You guys may recognize uh, this is actually a, a record size common snapping turtle that was collected in North Carolina and is now part of our collection. He was in, uh, in this procedure or needed a procedure. He, he presented to us with some disease in uh, one of his eyes, so one of the, the cornea or the outside part of one of his eyes, one disease, and he really got a hard time, or we had a hard time managing that. It would get infected and ulcerated and sort of was, was causing more and more problems. And so this was a procedure set up where we actually removed that globe. So we had an ophthalmologist here from the College of Medicine. We had residents in training to be specialists in ophthalmology. And they were able to perform this procedure here at the museum with us. Again, our visitors and students uh, all around asking questions and sort of a part of the whole conversation. We also do not only sort of clinical medicine, but we also do a little bit of research and work with some research animals here at the museum. And so in veterinary services, a lot of times we work with invertebrates, and there's not a lot established for them as far as medicine with it in vertebrates. So invertebrates, uh, if you guys know what those are, um, we're talking about things like insects. And in this uh, case, this is a slide with uh, an echinoderm. That is, this particular animal is a sea urchin. And so in this particular case, we were looking at anesthesia in sea urchins, which I'll let you know because I'm sure you have lots of questions about that. Yeah. Um, we'll have to hold those, remember your questions. But basically, no one has ever looked at some of the basic medical 
procedures in these unusual animals. And so things like sea urchins, and it may seem a little silly, like, why did you do this if I was a sea urchin? I get that question a lot. Um, so okay, sorry. Uh, it could probably be a veterinary test for that all the time. Uh, but the truth is, these things, both in captivity and in the wild, if, if, if we're going to do anything to, to help manage them, whether it be medically managed when we have diseases and die-offs, or if we're going to uh, manage endangered species or sort of understand how to work with them, we really need to know the, the basics in the clinic and the basic medical um, challenges that we face. In this particular case, there are a lot of cases that have been over the, the last few years of uh, sea stars, starfish, um, and, and the kind of drugs dying all over the, the Pacific Coast, there are huge radars of, of the exoskeletons of the skeletal parts uh, of these animals. Well, the bird, you know, nobody knows what's, what's causing or we didn't know what was causing it. But the first step to even work with one of these guys is like, well, how do you get blood? Do they have blood, first of all? How do you get a sample? How do you just start to do an evaluation? And the seizures are like the first step in that process. And so we were able to do a research project looking at common insects that were using vertebrate animals and see if they were in these, uh, in these you know, invertebrate animals, as they usually was. And, and it did, and again, save the question, I'll tell you more about that. Um, we worked with some more normal animals uh, in, in school uh, to become a veterinarian. Most of our work is on dogs and cats. Uh, but we, uh, here in the museum, I still work with mammals. Um, but I just work with a sloth. It's a little cooler than the water, the fact, but um, at least I think so. Maybe you guys don't think so. Um, this particular sloth is really cool to me because it came to the museum uh, in about 19, I think 1999, when I actually worked here as a curator before I went to med school long, long ago. Uh, I was a curator here and worked in the tropical uh, conservatory. You guys have been there. And did the AC building, or other building. And so this sloth has been in the museum since then. And, and, uh, so I've sort of known this sloth longer than I've known lots of my friends. So, anyways, now I'm his veterinarian, uh, not just his friend. We work with other mammals. Uh, this is one of our rabbits. Again, our mammals are our program animals here at the museum. But in our regular animal health, uh, you may come and see this is, uh, it's not actually a cocktail. Uh, but it sort of looks like our native rabbits. It's, it's a European uh, uh, hare or bunny that, that sort of a normal pet training type rabbits. But we use these for education. This one presented with a little mass on its side. So an educator had it out and said, whoa, I feel something kind of strange on this rabbit. Well, this rabbit had a tumor. It, it actually had a tumor in the skin um, that the, the programmer or the educator found. So it came to the window. We did a medical evaluation. We can do blood work, all the things that you, you do with your family veterinarian on, on your pet dog or your cat. And we actually were able to do a surgery and remove this uh, tumor uh, from the bunny rabbit. So again, students get to work on that. I get to do these cool things. And I get to share them with visitors uh, of all ages outside the window. We also work with birds. We, we don't have many birds in our collection. Um, I think we have six, actually, to be exact. Uh, and they're, they're all um, these sort of uh, African ringneck doves or, or uh, sort of a, a hybrid of such or close to that. We've had a lot of those birds for a long time again. And as a museum veterinarian working here with this collection, I get to see these animals through most of their lifetime or at least the time that they live here. So unlike the family veterinarian, you know, you bring your dog in, they get, get some treatment, and sometimes they get lost to follow up or, or you know, the veterinarian doesn't get to follow them through their whole their whole life or career or uh, whatever that animal is doing. In my case, I do get to follow these guys through their careers here at the museum. And so these doves come in, we work, uh, we do quarantine exams, we isolate them, we make sure they're healthy, we help them become a part of the, the collection, and then we follow them through um, really their lives here at the museum. We also have reptiles, and now we're getting into more numbers. Again, we probably have uh, several, maybe 100, 150 reptiles, something like that. 
Um, this particular reptile, this is an eastern box turtle. And again, this is a turtle that's been in our collection. I don't have his identification number up here, but a long time. Some of these box turtles have been here uh, since before I started my first time. So they are, they've been a part of the collection, a part of the museum uh, family, and, and now are under our veterinary services care. We uh, have some other reptiles. This is a bearded dragon. And again, just to give you diversity or an idea of the diversity we uh, get to work with, this guy presented with a mass on his mandible. You can see right there, kind of on the front of his mouth, he's got a, a, a mass or an enlargement. We're able to go in. Um, we do what's called a fine needle. A needle? Whoop, I started to lose it. Here we go. Sorry. Finger slip. I, I think my finger slip. Sorry. I've got, like, the mic police over here. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so we put a little needle in there with a syringe. We aspirate or we draw a little bit of material out, and we put it on a microscope slide. And that is a great way to get a, a picture of what's going on inside of that animal or inside of that mass. And we actually have a microscope also set up in our lab that as we examine a specimen or a slide, whether it's a blood slide or, or like in this case, a slide with cells from inside of this mass, visitors come up and join right in, and, and they can see and, and sort of make those discoveries with us. And so this turned out to be an infection. There were bacteria in here. We can culture those bacteria just like they do, again, when, when uh, you bring your dog or your cat to the veterinarian or, or even uh, people go to the, you know, you, we all go to the doctor. Um, we can culture these bugs and figure out which antibiotics are, are the best choice to treat them uh, and, and sort of move through a case that way. This, this guy's doing great, by the way. Whoop, oh, up, oh, quick, sorry. Uh, here we go. I also work with reptiles that are venomous. This is a, a cottonmouth, an eastern cottonmouth, native to North Carolina. Uh, this guy is actually anesthetized. He doesn't look like it. Um, I promise he's anesthetized. We don't handle these guys uh, unless they're anesthetized. That means he is fully out. That little white tube is actually going into an opening into his trachea, and we're providing a gas medicine or an anesthetic to keep him asleep while we work with him. That's how I like these guys, asleep um, while I work with them. This particular animal had a, a lesion or a, a, a sore in his mouth, another mass that was actually a fungus, a, a, a pathogenic fungus that was getting worse and worse and really hard to treat. And so he was in and out of the clinic a lot. We finally came up with a treatment that, that seemed to be really effective. And now this guy is also um, doing very well, also still in our collection. Uh, we work with amphibians. This is a hellbender, or I think they call them snot otters. I like that name better. Um, a snot otter. So if you guys see these, these are on exhibit in our Mountain Cove area. And this is a hellbender salamander that came in fairly recently uh, through quarantine, new to the collection that we've worked with uh, here. No health problems at this point that we know of uh, in good health. But again, a really unique species, um, native to North Carolina and, and fairly uh, rare as well that we get to work with here at the museum. This is another salamander, not quite as rare. This is a red salamander uh, that presented to us not doing very well, been in the collection, that A5, that, that A51301, that's actually his name. It's not a very exciting name. But A5 tells us that he came to the museum. We know that he came in 2005. So he's been here at least 10 years, came as an adult to the museum, presented to us for being a little lethargic, a little off, not wanting to eat. And so if you look on the, the images, if you can see the images here, um, as part of our exam, we could shine a light basically through the salamander. We call that transillumination. It's like if you guys are old enough in the back of comic books, you could buy like uh, those glasses that would like x-ray vision glasses. It's just like that. You can actually see through these salamanders. Um, it, it works probably better than those. Uh, they never, did, if you guys ever were, like I ordered those and, and they never came. I don't actually know what those glasses were, but. Um, when we shine a light through the salamander, we found a mass, a really dark area down in the uh, salomic cavity or abdominal region. And it turned out that this salamander a few days later had a little pebble in his enclosure. And I, I think uh, it seemed that that was a foreign body. And he actually passed that out and then started to eat and was doing better. But we could visualize, if you can see this slide close enough, you can actually see the heart and the heart beating, the vessels. Um, so, you know, this is a technique that we can use with our little patients that, that works really well. 
Some of our patients aren't quite as uh, rare, but they're still, we still like them. Uh, this is a bullfrog, um, American bullfrog, pretty common, native to, uh, uh, introduced in a lot of places around the world, n native to uh, uh, North Carolina, though. My button is not working. Let's see. Oh, there we go. This guy presented to us uh, with lesions. We don't know what caused these lesions. We had seen this animal about a week before. It looked perfectly fine. Came to us with, you can see um, these patches of, of uh, a lot of hyperemia, a lot of redness. Actual, it almost looked like um, necrosis, almost like there were some blisters there that kind of opened up, or at least necrotic tissue. Uh, we anesthetized this guy. Again, don't know what caused this. Was in a group of about four bullfrogs, and everybody else was doing pretty well. Um, but we cleaned him up. Again, anesthetized him, cleaned him up, got rid of that necrotic tissue, put a little topical medication on there. And this is, uh, let's see, about a month later, looked really good. So, again, we work with a lot of these cases. Sometimes we know why they're sick and what's going on. But sometimes, you know, it's even though we have this system, a closed system with all these animals at the museum, sometimes we're, we're not sure, you know, what's happening with them. So we see uh, cancer, neoplasia. That's really common. Um, I, I tell folks that if, if you, uh, uh, with reptiles, amphibians particularly, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't know how to care for them very well in captivity. And over the past 20 years, we've been getting that better and getting diet better and learning how to care for them. Honestly, when you figure that out, pretty much all these guys end up with uh, often with neoplasia or cancers um, sort of at the ends or towards the ends of their lives. So just like other animals you think about, even amphibians, we see a lot of tumors. Um, and, and some of these we can take out. This was one that occurred in the, the foot, basically, of this tree frog, and we were able to amputate uh, that limb at the, the elbow. And even though it's a tree frog and he's got toe pads and uses those feet, he was absolutely fine and, and lived uh, another, I think, year and a half or two years um, in our discovery room in, in that exhibit. So we work with fish, kind of moving along here. Um, th this is uh, an example of a fish procedure. Um, usually with our fish, we do anesthetize them. We get them sleepy. We put medicine in the water. We move that water across their gills. Uh, if you... See, this case, we also can do sort of what we do with people, again, um, or your dogs and cats. We, if we need blood samples or other diagnostic samples, even in fish, we can collect those. Uh, some of our fish are really weird. This is, uh, does anybody, uh, uh, if anybody knows what this, does anybody know what this fish is? I'm just going to break the rules. Oh, you guys don't count. Okay, let me look at it. Anybody else know what this fish is? All right, what is this fish? A tongue fish, yeah, and, and related to soles, a flat fish, a, a related to flounder, if you guys know flounder. Um, good call. It's called a tongue fish. These are the weirdest little fish you can imagine. They have two eyes on one side like a flounder. They're shaped like a tongue, um, and they've got a little tiny mouth, so they're, they're a little bit challenging. Some of our patients can be a challenge to, to work up in the clinic. This is a, a fish that presented to us with um, what we call exophthalmia. Its eyeball was bulging out, basically, and very red, if you can see, it's very red around the outside. Well, in uh, doing our procedures, figuring out what was going on, it turned out this guy had worms, and there were several of them in this group, wound around the, the periorbital space around their eyeball. So if you look on this slide, that is a four-centimeter nematode. Um, I can tell you that fish was not maybe four centimeters long. Um, this worm was about as long as the fish we took it out of, wound around that space. So again, these are pretty cool things. This is, this is something that has, uh, these worms have been described, but the procedure to remove them has never really been described um, in, in science or in, in what we call the literature. Um, so this was a pretty neat procedure where we were able to save these fish. These are the same uh, little bluegills, actually, that are on exhibit in the, the building next door. We, <laughs> we also... <laughs> Sorry about that. I might need some water. Um, these are... We also work with invertebrates. Uh, this is a roach. This is a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Um, what do you guys think about this roach? Yeah, right. It looks like a dead roach. Okay. It's not dead, I swear. This is another one of our research projects where we looked at anesthesia in insects. 
This roach, I swear it's not dead. It is anesthetized. It is sleeping. Um, it is kind of funny, though, because it's just like on the cartoons when they show a dead bug and their legs are up. Um, that's pretty much what an anesthetized uh, roach looks like. So we do work with invertebrates. So this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Th these are my last couple slides. Um, and, and I was told I couldn't do too many slides. Hopefully I didn't do too many. Um, th this is for you guys to, to be veterinarians uh, or to show you a little bit about what we do and how we work things up. So this is uh, a radiograph. So this is an x-ray of a tree frog. Okay, so this is a pretty small tree frog. Um, it's probably about, I don't know, I'll say like um, maybe eight centimeters snout vent. So pretty big for a tree frog. Um, but pretty small patient, and it presented for uh, lethargy, so it was kind of lethargic, it was kind of quiet, not moving around, didn't want to eat, so it was anorexic. We have all these 25-cent words in vet medicine. Basically, it didn't want to eat, it was sitting on the bottom, and just not doing right. And you know, the, the keepers um, or the curators, they work with these animals all the time, and so when one's a little off, they, they notice pretty quickly. So this guy presented, uh, looked at it, palpated it, that means we kind of felt it all over to see if we felt any bumps or lumps or anything abnormal, had some little bumps down in its uh, abdominal area or its salomic cavity, um, and this is, uh, so get a radiograph, and this is what the radiograph looks like. So um, it's, I'm kind of cheating because there's an arrow there, but do you guys, uh, first of all, uh, what's, what's wrong with this picture or what doesn't fit? And I'm going to tell you, since I cheated, there's a little arrow. Those little white objects on the radiograph, uh, they don't belong there. I, I will also tell you that on a radiograph, things that are really white are things that are really dense, like metals and uh, bone and stone and, and things like that. Things that are black on a radiograph are usually like air or fat. Um, fluid can kind of go either way, depending on what, what, you know, what the fluid is. So I have these really white uh, blobs in the middle of my radiograph. So what do you guys think? Anybody have a guess what's going on? Yes, what do you think? Gravel, absolutely. See, you're a veterinarian already. Um, it's not all rocket science. Yeah, so this guy was in a terrarium or an aquarium um, on gravel substrate, and these guys aren't very uh, careful when they eat, and they kind of use their hands and gulp up, uh, in this case, probably crickets for the most part. And he swallowed these stones. And so that's a really common problem with our amphibians is that they ingest these stones. They're foreign bodies, so they block up the GI tract. And if they're too big, sometimes they can expel them orally, and sometimes they work all the way through their system, and they you know, come out when they defecate. But sometimes they get kind of stuck in the GI tract. In this particular case, we had to go in surgically and remove these stones from inside of the frog. And that's what they look like. So... Uh, good job on reading the radiograph. And that's all I have in slides. That's my very fast version of uh, what I do here at the museum. And so I, I think I'm supposed to turn this over now for questions. Hey, turn over. How about a nice round of applause right. for Dan Dombrowski? Right. And uh, yes, yeah, so the rest of our program is Q&A. And uh, so we encourage you to raise your hand, get my, I'll be handling this, so I'll uh, get my attention and I'll try to get around you. We'd like to have all the questions into the microphone because our programs stream live on YouTube and you can see them there also later. And let me ask you one to start with. So, because you mentioned uh, we don't have that many mammals, but we do have some, and one is that sloth. We have about two, and I'm just going to say, we have about two dozen mammals other than rats and mice, and how I know that is because we have to have a USDA license um, for uh, having those mammals. But go ahead, go for it. We have a hedgehog. Yes, have several have hedgehogs, yes, yes. yes. Um, but the sloth you mentioned that we've had for quite a long time, um, what do you know about sloths? Because we've had this sloth here for 15 years or so. Tell us something about the sloth. It's kind of an animal we're not that familiar with. Um, what's it like to get to know a sloth like that? Uh, at least our sloth, yeah. its urine pH is higher than I would expect. How about that? Is that a fact? Is that good? It's about eight. Um, that's a little I higher. I expected that. That's higher than I would expect. So, um, and so here's the challenge. That's is a that great normal? question. That's its normal. Behavior. Well, here's the challenge. I work with one sloth. There aren't, even though they're 
relatively common in captivity, not a lot of work is done. These are animals that just kind of survive, and, and there's not a lot of medical issues, and there's not a lot published on them. And so urine pH, the reason that's important is our sloth had a urinary tract infection. So we, we were able to sample some urine from, with a needle from the bladder, um, looked at that urine, it had bacteria in it, and so that, that's a pretty significant medical problem. And something that goes along with that is looking at the rest of the urine and the chemistry, and that's how I know that the urine pH was very high. I like how so much stuff in life is relative and it's how you look <laughs> at it, because you say, we got to sample the urine. That's not the way a lot of people look at that sort of situation. So how many people in the world do you think have sampled that well, urine on a sloth, right? right? Yeah. Hey, I mean, you, you're, you gotta, you gotta get it where you can. So count your distinction. So we have a question right here. Good. Hi. So um, I'm just curious about actually where they come from. Are these uh, collected by researchers in the field? So, for example, the salamanders are things that are harder to find. Yeah. Are these researchers studying those species that have the collection permits and can then donate them for the museum, or, or do you get them in another way? Um, so it's a great question, uh, fun to answer, because we get them in lots of different ways. And I would say it depends on the animal that, that you're talking about. So the question was, where do all these animals come from? And they come from everywhere or everything from we collect them. So a lot of our native stream fish, for example, um, we have permits, and we actually go out and we collect those. We're the primary collector of those animals. Um, if it's something like a corn snake in, in our program collection, a lot of times we'll get those from captive breeders because they're available in the pet trade. And so if it's an endangered species like a hellbender um, or a snot otter, I'm going to start calling it, um, our snot otter came from uh, a group that was captive bred for a conservation research project, and they had lots of babies available. And so we trade with other institutions. Um, if we can, we get them sort of the, we try to look for the, the way that's the least impact to get these things. We do have a lot of native stuff that not a lot of other people keep. A lot of these like stream minnows and such, um, they're not really common in captivity and a lot of other institutions come to us to kind of share and get, get these as well. Uh, just to add to that, I can go on and on, just to add that quickly. Um, a lot of them live a really long time. Like, we, we have a pretty good program, and, and we literally have stream minnows and, and small stream fish, just as an example, that are like seven or eight or ten years old, which, which is kind of unheard of for, you know, a little shiner. Um, so, again, least impact possible, but get them lots of different ways. I was just wondering if you had to um, create or get special tools for, you're operating on things that are like an inch or two long. It's not the typical kind of surgery that most vets would have to do. Uh, so, excellent question about where do we get the tools that we use. So, I would say the tools are, are based on sort of what's available um, for things like dogs and cats and out there, but we often have to kind of make our own version. And uh, Shane uh, Christian works with me in our veterinary services group, and a lot of times we put our heads together and say, well, we need something that's like sharp and has a point and a little curve about this big, and somehow, I don't know how Shane comes up with them, so that, that's how it works. I don't know where he gets them from, but that's how it works. Um, one of the slides that you showed it was the fish that you said that had the worm around the eye. I'm yeah. just curious, how does the fish survive out of water when you're doing the procedure? I, I love to answer that question, too. Um, so fish, uh, they, they need oxygen, just like we do. We breathe air, and our lungs are kind of like lots of wet surface area that we get that exchange of oxygen across. Well, fish are in the water, and they get their oxygen from the water, but it's kind of the same concept. Their gills are wet and there and lots of surface area. And as long as we provide them with oxygenated water moving across their gills, and, and, you know, are gentle with their skin and don't let them dry out and keep them wet, basically keep them wet and keep their gills oxygenated. They do just fine sort of mostly out of water. And so um, this, the slide that's up now, if you can see it, this, this is a bonnet head shark. Uh, if you can see the fellow there uh, and it's, it's mouth or, or head of the shark has a tube with water that's going across the gills. It also usually has medicine in it that's an anesthetic that keeps them asleep. And we can do everything from a physical exam 
to biopsies. Sometimes we take samples of tissue to surgeries. You can do a full-blown surgery out of the water on a fish as long as you're careful and keep the gills oxygenated um, and keep them anesthetized. Yes. Um, do y'all do any conservation programs or like captive breeding programs? Here? Yeah, so uh, we have, um, that's a great question, uh, conservation programs. In veterinary services, uh, we kind of have our hands full with what we do for the museum, but we do also work a little bit with wildlife cases and some of our uh, field researchers. Um, everything from uh, we help uh, with surgeries to put radio transmitters in, in snakes. That's a surgery we do for, for one, of, uh, one of or some of our researchers. Um, and then often we're kind of, because we're set up like we are, we sometimes get cases of, of sick wildlife, not from the general public. I can't take like sick, you know, bird strikes and stuff, uh, bird window strikes. I have to tell you now, that's like a disclaimer. But when they get a really weird case, particularly a reptile or amphibian, we often are set up to help with that as well. Outside of our group, some of our living collection staff here at the museum work on other projects. There's uh, a group called the Turtle Survival Alliance that works with turtles, and our, our staff that work with turtles are a part of that. Our fish group, um, they work with some, uh, again, Wildlife Commission projects on shad. Um, so a lot of that's going on, and we just kind of work, you know, it's all of those projects need a medical, usually some medical component, and, and I find that our best place is to kind of support those other folks, so. I kind of have two questions, if that's allowed. Uh, the first is... Two questions, is that allowed? <laughs> They should be both. They should be both easy. Uh, my first is keeping track of all those animals. Do you pit tag all of your animals to keep track of them? And my second was, I noticed that that's an aquarium T-shirt. Um, do you do a lot of collaboration with the aquariums? All right. So I'm going to answer the second one first. This is kind of cheating because this is when I was a student. Um, this is about uh, nine or ten years ago at the aquarium uh, with Dr. Greg Lubart, who was my mentor, is my friend and mentor from uh, the College of Vet Medicine. And so this is uh, one of their fish at their facility, and this was a part of a class that I did there. So um, you, you kind of busted me on that picture. We, we do have a bonnet head, but that's not it. Um, anyways, so I'll answer that one first. Your next question about pit tagging. So uh, a pit tag is a, a passive tag. It's just like the, the um, chips that people put in, in their dogs commonly, um, in their pets. And so it's a tag that doesn't have a battery, but if you take a reader, you can read the tag. It has a, an identification number associated with it. We do use those pit tags in our larger animals and in animals that, that it's appropriate for. Um, but some of our animals are, are smaller uh, and, and we need other methods. And so some other things we do, because it, it is very important to individually identify as many animals as possible. If we're gonna spend time and effort on medical care, of a frog, we need to know who that frog is in a year or 10 years uh, to, to follow those cases. So we use something called an elastomer tag, which is kind of like a little colored uh, silicon material that we can inject under the skin. If you shine a black light over it, it fluoresces. It comes in about four or five good colors that we can inject in different places. So we use elastomer tags. Um, we don't do a lot of, uh, but it can be done. Like some of our turtles come to us, and they've been marked by, you know, putting a little groove in their shell in a certain place. We don't, I don't do that with our animals, but they come to us that way sometimes. So um, anyways, if that answers your question, we pit tag the ones we can, and we do whatever uh, we can. One slide I had up here before, dart frogs. Some animals like dart frogs, poison dart frogs, have patterns that are like fingerprints, and, and even as simple as a photo ID can be challenging, but you know, if you've got a dozen animals and a dozen photos, a lot of times you can tell who they are just that way too, so. Yes? Uh, two questions. How did you remove the rocks from the frogs, and then when you get somebody from another veterinarian from the vet school, do they come over as a volunteer project, or do you pay them? Yeah, okay. Wow, you're letting two questions just slide right by. <laughs> um, so uh, your first question about the stones and the frogs. So um, in that particular case, and in cases like that, uh, first of all, we usually start out orally to look into the stomach to see if we can retrieve that foreign body just, you know, with a scope and with tools. Um, I had another frog present, a bullfrog, 
the eight, this was in my talk and I took it out because I had to have fewer slides. Um, but we took out a piece of plant material, that, a plastic plant that it ate. And I used a scope and some tools and I could just pull that out when he was anesthetized. The frog you saw, actually we had to do an incision into the salomic cavity, open it up, go into the GI tract um, and, and pulled those out surgically and just removed them and sewed them all back up, sewed the frog back up and, and moved on. Uh, another case that I sometimes show in my talk that I took out uh, on a frog, we, we have an individual frog, it's called a waxy monkey frog, that we've had at the museum for like nine or ten years, I think that long. Um, but it's been through several surgeries similar to that, but to remove bladder stones. And so that one, same thing, go in, open it up, take the stone out, uh, and then suture it back up, just like you would a person or a dog or a cat. And your second question, if I remember, my, my memory's kind of short, but um, was about the veterinarians that come. Are they volunteers or do they get paid? So uh, I, am, I am fortunate to have a position as a veterinarian here at the museum, uh, paid. Um, I can't sometimes, I, I can't believe they pay me to do what I do. It's, you know, it's a lot of fun. If I didn't get paid, I'd want to do it anyways. Um, but our veterinarians, we have a program that we developed as a community partnership program where veterinarians can volunteer their time, come in, you know, a day a week, work with us with vet students and with the public. And what's cool about that is we've had folks that are pathologists or like aquatic specialists or small animal veterinarians that work with dogs and cats. They can come in and they can be with us on a snake case and they learn about how to work with snakes in, in a clinic. But then they can talk about, yeah, you know, and I, wow, we're, we're doing this procedure on a snake. I had to aspirate a mass on a cat last week and here's what we did. And so it really opens up dialogue between them and our students and the public. And, and it's really just kind of this laid back conversation that way. So they, they don't get paid. Um, but anyways, they, they we encourage them to come work with us. Uh, yes, is, is there a network of uh, museum and zoo veterinarians? So if you come across something you've never seen before or stumped on that you can either consult them or they can pick your brain uh, and maybe give an example if that's the case. Yeah, um, so that's a great question about, I would say I know of one other museum veterinarian, so it's a network of two that I know of. Um, but as far as zoos and aquariums and, and facilities like ours, uh, as a veterinarian, we go through four years of, of college, vet, vet school, uh, and, and graduate and take a big test. It, it's like, I don't know, take six hours or something. Uh, if you pass the test, then you can be a veterinarian and really work on, at that point, anything as a veterinarian. But if you want to specialize in anything from like pathology to ophthalmology, work on eyes, or zoo medicine, or you know reptiles and amphibians in the clinic, there are uh, specialty boards, and so you you get trained through programs, and you take another test that takes a long time, um, and then you become boarded, and so those are specialists, and so there are I think I want to uh, I want to say two to four hundred I forget what the number is now of zoo vets that are boarded that work in zoos and aquariums and other facilities. And we go to conferences kind of all together and meet, present cases that we see that are interesting and unusual, like that frog case, removing stones. I could present that at a conference. We learn that way from each other. And then literally we just call each other on the phone and, and ask questions too. Here at NC State, we have a lot of folks that do a lot of this sort of work with unusual animals. Dr. Greg Lubart that was up there is a, you know, a, an expert in fish medicine. And so we've got a fish, we're looking, uh, we've got a sick fish and we've got, you know, we can get a blood sample, we look at blood chemistry, and then we gotta figure out, well now I got numbers, what does that mean and what do I do with that? Well then I can call him up and say, hey, what do you think I got this? And, and so we can, um, you know, trade notes that way too. The aquariums here in North Carolina, they now have a veterinarian that works all three aquariums. That's a new position, kind of like mine, where they have a veterinarian dedicated to help them with their fish. Um, she, she and I communicate, uh, and the veterinarian at the North Carolina Zoo, you know, on email, ask questions. I, I literally a week ago sent a question. Um, we had a beaded lizard, which is a venomous lizard, not native to North Carolina, kind of like a Gila monster. We wanted to put a pit tag in it. I'm tying all your questions together. It's like a game. <laughs> we want to put a pit tag in it. And my question was, um, we have some lizards like that that are tagged in their tail. Their tails are big, fat tails. 
Um, but usually we put pit tags up in the shoulder of animals like that, of tetrapods. And so my question to him was, hey, man, you've got some of these. Where do you tag them? And he got back to me and said they tag them in the tail, too. He didn't know why, but that's where I tag ours. So, you know, a lot of times it's that. It's an end of, like, two or something. But um, good question. Have you ever had a sort of medical situation that you needed to call someone in? Uh, you mean as far as, like, an emergency situation? Um, I, I can't think if we've done – I call Shane in, and Shane helps me in emergencies. Um, I, I can't think of a situation like that, but, but I wouldn't hesitate to do it. I mean, it's a pretty tight-knit – once you get out into the, you know, out on a limb with these exotic species, it's a pretty tight group. Everybody in veterinary medicine working with exotics – pretty much know each other, and there's a lot of communication, I would say. Well, you just sort of touched on this, but one thing I was thinking is that medical doctors uh, only work on one species. They work on humans. And then yeah. even within that, they specialize as different kinds of doctors. You see not only all these different species. you There are mammals and reptiles and amphibians and fish. How does one uh, get educated to the point that you could work on such different types of systems? I, I think the first step is just like you got to be open-minded and you got to approach these cases. Um, pretty much medicine, uh, you know, anatomy, physiology, uh, there's a lot of it that's kind of the same basis, and, and you approach it with the same sort of concepts in medicine, and then you just have to, you know, that's the 80%, and then the 20% is like, you know, this is a sloth. It's a mammal, but its body temperature is, you know, 85 degrees instead of 100 degrees. And, and so I, I think the first step is just to be open-minded to approach the cases with what you already know and then kind of tease out those differences. So, um, There are some species of animals that have open circulatory systems. How would you handle a surgery on an animal like that? All right. Open certain. Now you guys are getting, like, detailed. Um, what kind of animals have open circulatory systems? Oh, I was going to answer that. I can't answer Okay, good. Okay. Or no, you can answer that. Good. No. All right. Um, open circulatory systems. So, uh, and, and if you're thinking something else, let me know. But, like, uh, some of our invertebrates, like um, insects, have, and, and arthropods, um, insects have a system where they have a heart like we do. So, so think grasshopper. Uh, or cockroach. Let's go back to cockroach. Think cockroach. They have a heart that is like, it's a tube-like structure that runs dorsally. So instead of having a heart sort of on the bottom side, they have it on their back. And it's a tube that basically is directional. They just, it kind of pulls fluid from one end and puts it out at the other end of the cockroach. Um, so that's an open circulatory system. Th that fluid that's like blood, it's called hemolymph, bathes the cells of the animal, brings oxygen to those cells, bathes the, the cells of the animal, um, and also, in this case, helps them walk. It's hydrostatic pressure that makes their, their legs uh, move and go up and down. And so in those cases, we can sample that like we do blood. We can look at chemistry like we do blood. And honestly, in those animals, the, the hardest thing is um, with uh, mammals or vertebrates, usually the things without an exoskeleton, the skin can kind of heal and scar over and, and fix itself. With things with an exoskeleton, it doesn't work very well. So we get into having to, it's kind of like auto body shop. We're like patching the exoskeleton with like stuff that we're, you know, bondo and, and gluing things on. Um, so as long as it's not too much loss of that fluid, as long as we can close up the exoskeleton, we can use saline and fluids that we're familiar and comfortable with to, to rehydrate them in some cases. Um, and go from there. But that's definitely like the cutting edge. Is that what you meant, like like insects? Yeah. Good question. Super glue is our, our medication of choice for exoskeletons. And, and Have you ever been operating on an insect and just had a moment where you thought, what am I doing? I'm operating on an insect? Uh, yeah, so I started out kind of as a more like a uh, an entomologist. I, I actually did my graduate work with butterflies. And um, so I started out pinning butterflies. And, and if you guys know, like, like dry. How's that help them? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's, that's, I'm repenting for all that time. So you didn't do any veterinary type, like help, like, like, I don't know, how does a butterfly with a fever 
or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, my so, butterfly's acting a little odd. Yeah. I can't quite figure out what it so, is. So, again, you're like way out on the limb here. Um, <laughs> but let me just throw out there I, I always say it sounds silly. I'm going to say two things. One, uh, we did establish an invertebrate medicine club at NC State that has been active and going for probably 10 or 11 or 12 years now. There are a group of veterinary students interested in invertebrate medicine. Uh, and there actually is already a second edition invertebrate medicine textbook. So it's not just me. Um, there are a few other people out there, uh, but there you go. Are the pit tag numbers, do they correspond with the ISIS numbers, or are they the same? Um, so what does that mean? Yeah, good question. <laughs> pit tags. So, again, these pit tags are these passive identification. I don't remember what pit stands for. Something like that. Passive. Transponder, thank you very much for helping me. That's my plant out there in the audience. Um, I'll pay you later. Uh, so these things, um, they don't have a battery. And so when we put, just to back up a little bit, sometimes we put uh, uh, um, radio transmitters into animals that have a battery and, like, produce an active signal, but it takes power to do that or a battery. And they're usually bigger, and you can track those animals from long distances. So from, you know, a mile away, you can pick up a signal and find them. Even bigger, you can do it from satellites. But these things, these ta these pit tags, are passive. They don't have any power, but you can read them. With it's like when you walk out of Walmart and forgot to pay for the CD, um, and the alarms go off. It's like that. You can get a reader, and it picks it up, and it gives you a number, and that number is specific to that tag. So the very short answer, instead of long, is no, they don't match. That tag is specific to pit tags, and I believe is specific to that one of that brand period so that you can identify, like if it were your dog or if it were my uh, bullfrog, um, I would know if someone found my bullfrog in their backyard that had gotten out of its pen that, that that was my bullfrog because it had that pit tag number. But ISIS numbers, that's our internal sort of identification system and uh, completely separate. Sorry. Um, following up on his question about the breadth of species with which you have to deal, um, what's the most challenging or oddest case you've had to deal with here? Those are absolutely two separate things, so that's like two questions. I have to admit, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, um, things with fur are such a mess and you got to shave them and it, you know, it's that handful of, like, rabbits and chinchillas, and they bite. And I'm kind of more like a reptile, amphibian, fish. I'm much more comfortable with those. They don't have fur. You just keep them wet, and it's a lot easier, I think, to work with. Um, it, you know, uh, we're working on everything from, like, you saw that tongue fish. I mean, literally, it's weird enough to work with fish, but then to have a fish that – or a seahorse, for example – those things look like they have an exoskeleton, right? If you guys have ever seen a seahorse up close, you can't get to their gills. I mean, I, I can't even, my usual fish procedures, which are weird because they're fish, I can't even do on a seahorse because I can't even get to those parts. So uh, there's a lot of challenges like that. And I really, for me, I love doing, I mean, I love the challenge of something new. And I, I really enjoy making the connection of, you know what? I heard about this in dogs last week. I wonder if that's what's going on with this, you know, chinchilla or this seahorse. And I got to tell you, we stumble on that stuff. If you look for it, you find it. And if you're kind of open-minded, it's not that different. And so we find a lot of things that haven't really been described and make a lot of those connections, even with our, our group of animals here. So, Yeah, sort of along those lines. I mean, we're going to wrap up here in a couple minutes, uh, but... Uh uh, what makes for a really good day for you? What are some? Do you have some favorite creatures? So you just eliminated the furred creatures, so they're not. Oh boy, I'm gonna pay for that. And you have a background with insects and butterflies. Yeah. Do you have some favorite animals? Your very favorite? Uh, or favorite here at the museum? Yeah. Um, my absolute. I'm gonna say my favorite animal here is probably that waxy monkey frog I told you guys about. It's been here a long time. It's been through a lot of procedures. Um, I like working with amphibians. Uh, we can do things with them again. Not many people work with them. That particular frog, you know, we can anesthetize it. It goes down under quick with anesthesia. We can do our surgeries, get it repaired, and it wakes up with like a big smile on its face. So I would say any Great. day. Those are the qualities I look for in a friend. Yeah, right. Me Easily too. anesthetized, wakes up with a smile on his face. Yes, we can be friends. Yeah, all right. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and so is that what makes a really great day for you? What's something that, like, your favorite thing to do here? I, I mean, there is nothing like being presented with, you know, an animal, and, and maybe all medical people say this, an animal that's, like, not breathing or not doing well or a fish that's just in terrible shape or, or any animal that needs care and really being able to get there and help it. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's it's up and around and, and it made it through the day and even better if it makes it for another week or two or, or long after that. Right. So, so saving a life. Yeah, yeah man, anytime. Yeah, anytime yeah. We, even if it's like a, you know, a, a little tarantula or sure. something, it's cool, so. That's excellent. And so um, what else? Like, what do you want to leave? You've kind of hit on a lot of stuff here. What do you want uh, people to leave here knowing about uh, um, I veterinary would, medicine here at the All right. Here at the Here's what I would say. We just had a conference with veterinarians, about 2,000 um, veterinary professionals from around the state here in Raleigh. They came to the museum, some of them for an event. And I think half a dozen veterinarians, some of them were in my class, don't know about our window on animal health upstairs. So I just want everybody to leave here knowing that we that's where we practice our medicine. We generally schedule our medical cases from 1.30 to 3.30, Monday through Friday. And please, if you're around or available or want to come up and meet us and say hello, talk to our students, 1.30 to 3.30, Monday through Friday. We're on the second floor right above here. When they cook food, I can smell it in my office. <laughs> um, so come visit us. That's what I have to say. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much. How about a nice round of applause for Dan Dombrowski? <laughs> and um, like I said, we're closed next Thursday. It's Thanksgiving. And the Thursday after that is trivia night. And uh, really, we're, uh, Katie will be very happy if you email her from this sheet of paper and tell her you want to participate in our science spelling bee on December 17th. So um, this building is still open till 9 o'clock, so we're going to wrap this up. And uh, very often, Dan, uh, people still want to talk to you afterwards. Dan will be around for a few minutes. But thank you very much. Great questions and everything tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you guys very much.